and we're live. Mark Vanderwall, my good friend, good to see you again. Good for to see you. 26th session, because we did a 26th session last session, but we're saving that one for the holiday season, and we have to talk about some of the very big news of the week, but we're definitely going to parade through some pleasantries before we get to the topic of the hour. Does that sound all right to you, Mark? That works, yeah. So you bought some corals, right? You bought some I corals and I a device. Did. Oh, yeah. tell us, tell us the story. I love this uh, <laughs> the drunk ordering man because I'm I'm also guilty. Yeah, you know I've been trying to hold true to the original intent going back to like 2018 when I was like, yeah, I'm gonna take a break from SPS and just go with a bunch of softies and just let them overgrow like crazy and just have like a nice low maintenance tank. And But uh, I don't know if it's just talking to you and different stuff, I, but um, yeah, so over the weekend, uh, we had some nice weather here uh, and I was sitting outside on my porch drinking some beers and I was kind of rummaging through, staring at my fish tank yeah, I was thinking about like the S, like some of what are some of my favorite SBS, you know, just a stupid mental list. Um, How I stupid! That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You're making a mental checklist of your favorite marine life. No person in their right mind would ever do that. You know, you're just sitting there drinking <laughs> a beer, listening to some music, stare at your reef tank, um, and I think it spawned on some of the discussions you and I've had, and also some of the stuff that's going on on social media with some of the folks that we know about how a lot of the uh, old SPS staghorns, you know, are are sort of missing. In the, I don't know if they're missing in the trade. I, I couldn't say that for sure, but it's just you they're don't see them. Missing from the headlines. Yeah. Um, so and and you and I were talking about Abrolo census and um, but yes, yeah, so I was sitting there and I was like, man, you know, other corals I've really liked were the ORA Hawkins and the um, also the ice and f ice and fire Echinata. Mm -hmm. um, of all the old school corals, I would say the Hawkins Echinata is probably still one of the most widespread it's because it has yeah. awesome color really tight growth but you copped a couple yeah so then i was searching i was like oh i wonder if like the ice and fire i haven't seen anybody talk about that one in a while i was like i wonder if it's still available and then i saw a site that sold both and i was mm -hmm. like oh man you know crack open another beer and i just ordered them and then i was like well crap now i've got more sps in my tank <laughs> but that's okay it's fun it is um, fun i mean i think that's a sign not that you're not sticking to your guns, but that yeah. you're just engaged with your aquarium. You know, you wrote that one like timeless piece about um, careful neglect of a reef tank. Because if you're in the hobby for a really long time, there's gonna be periods in your life where you got to coast. You yeah. know, and you can't just always be up in it. And I know you've uh, you know always been at it a pretty high level, but you've waxed and waned to the degree uh, of which you, you know, really plant your tank. So what did you end up getting? Uh, yeah, so I got the Ice and Fire, the Hawkins, and then um, just a coral that at one point was all the rage. And I just was like, you know, I've never kept that coral or any uh, any coral of that genus, uh, the uh, Space Invader Pectinia. So I just oh, threw that nice. in. Oh, nice. Very um, nice. I know, I know they can be uh, nasty with sweepers somebody said but if you look at a lot of people's tanks including mine they are so glorious but they're managed by kind of being relegated to the bottom or corner or side yeah. of the tank you can see it in a lot of people's reef tanks it'll be front of the glass or side of the glass or the very top left it's like a galaxia but just not quite as pugnacious yeah, well, it's a cool, you know, it's, I've never kept Pectinia, to be honest. So I thought, you know, that'd be a fun one to go with. Um, and then I think I talked in the past about uh, my gyres were so old. And, you know, back in the day, I did use vinegar. So maybe that had something to do with pump cleaning and making things brittle. But the, uh, the power cords that were submerged, the, the submerged person were really hard and brittle. So when I was swapping tanks, I noticed that. And I was like, ooh, I don't want to throw these in my tank anymore. Um, so I've been uh, coasting with a single Tunzi uh, 6105. I don't know. Just a big stream pump. Is it a ball-shaped one? Yeah. It's not, it's not the old, like, minivan. No, no. It's the, uh, 
it's like the ball shape but uh and it was doing fine you know i mean um the two svs i do have were encrusting and the flow looked pretty good because my tank's pretty shallow yeah um and i got a lot of uh, a lot more flow going through the sump uh for now since i knew i was down a pump but so i ordered another tunzi for the other side but i wanted to try that crazy stream three um mm -hmm. I don't know. I like weird things like that. Um, I, I don't mean to call it weird, but just unique things like that where... It's an original design. Yeah. it's. Uh, I was curious about it. Um, so I ordered one of those. I haven't gotten that yet, but uh, excited to try that. I'm just throw that behind my rock work and let it go nuts and have a little more flow. Nice. Oh, it's really fun to see you tinkering. <laughs> like exactly like you said you wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's bad. Next no, thing it's not. It's second not reef tank. And it's a great <laughs> indication. I'm over here with like 20 tanks. You know, just <laughs> I got I got nothing. You know, no room to talk. But I don't know. well, that's cool. I went to I got a new coral. Also, I went yeah. to Akashala in Dallas, and it was a really cool, balanced show between the freshwater, the saltwater, the livestock, and the manufacturers. So I really appreciated that, and they had a great lineup of speakers. You know, oh, yeah? at, this, at this point, you know, obviously I love going to shows to see the corals, to talk to the, the companies and find out what's going on. But after such a long absence, it was just really great to get some face time with Fan Thine of uh, Tidal Gardens, of Sanjay Joshi, of Dr. Photon Man, you know, and oh, just yeah. talk reef. It was, that was my favorite part. But what's funny is I found one coral, uh, not at Aquashella. But the day before, at some kind of get together at uh, Dallas North Aquarium, so shout out to DNA Dallas North Aquarium for shipping me a single coral <laughs> for a, a really fair price. I've been looking for this coral for about three years. It used to be really common, and I think it's because it's more of an oceanic coral, and so it has a wide range, but. You could find it in Indonesia if you went far enough offshore where yeah. it's probably not the kind of corals you want to collect. And so I think they were coming in from Fiji a lot more. But the coral is a Leptoria. It came in today. Um, so there's a maize brain, you know, and then there's what I call a true platygyra. And I got a beautiful colony of that about two weeks ago from ACI. And then a Leptoria is what I call the scribble brain. The you know, only sounds the same, but. Leptoria just has way more always parallel like ridges and valleys that are you know ridged but also kind of streamlined compared to uh, uh, Platygyra or Paragoniastria. What I'm, I'm starting, <laughs> I just decided I figured out how to win that battle. I'm just going to call it true Platygyra and false Platygyra because that's easy enough for people to remember. And then when they're like, they hear false Platygyra, they're like, well, what's a false Platygyra? Oh, it's this whole nother world of, you know, maize brain coral. But man, it was crazy that, that this coral used to be, you could just pick up anywhere, anytime. But, you know, if we can't call Paragoniastria by its name, the hopes that someone's going to recognize or notice the Leptoria are pretty slim. And it was in their display tank for, they said, like four to six months. Not not like oh, a display wow. coral for sale tank, not a display tank. Through the moment I walked in, I'm like, that's what I'm buying. And it's before Aquashella. And that is the only thing I'm going to get all weekend long. And I stuck to my guts. <laughs> I only added one coral to my 1,000 pieces. <laughs> that's a cool so much coral to grow big, you know, just to have a big old... Like it's of. such a beautiful coral. This yeah. one piece, it's just it's perfectly you know round and it's kind of got a nice like uh, attractive asymmetrical kind of hump to it, you know. So you can enjoy it from all kinds of different sides, and it's that's given me ideas. Nice, yeah. I I see all these shows, and my only annoyance factor is they always pick uh, weekends that. Um, would be hard for me to go as a dad. Yeah. Halloween, I gotta take my kids trick or treating. Um, no, I heard that from a lot Mac of people. Macna sometimes is on like a Labor Day, like weekend. I'm like, come on, man. Like, <laughs> I've heard that from a lot of people, but I actually went as the uh, Bob Ross of corals, which I've been named a couple times, and I just kind of leaned into it, and it was really fun. It oh, was I so bet. Much yeah, fun. people. There was a Bob Ross of freshwater aquascaping there. 
Nice. And we took I pictures together. I saw the together. picture of you two together. Yeah, yeah that, that was that pretty was funny. Just, that was super funny because I have my you know little palette with some small kind of artificial corals glued on. And then he had his much bigger palette with like pieces of fake you know, on plastic plants glued onto that. And I was like, <laughs> hell yeah, man. We definitely have had the right, exact same idea, but in our own lanes. Yeah, if it was just on a more random weekend, I could be like, hey, honey, you mind if I go to Texas to a reef show? And my mm-hmm. wife would be like, go for it, you know? But, it, you know, it'd be a hard sell Halloween, to say I'm yeah. going to miss that. Yeah. Totally get that. But I also get that that adds some thema- thematic flavor to the show, too, and makes it a lot more fun. So I get it. I don't know ways. if I'd want every single any show i wouldn't want any show to fall on any holiday year after year after year um except for you know might be mac Knot and labor day because i'm ambivalent and it's really close to my birthday so just bundle it all up into one nice long weekend and uh i'm okay with that my first mac back in 2000 was on my wife's birthday and she was nice enough to let me go with i mean she came along but she was bored out of her mind <laughs> oh no i'm so, sure you, you had to make up for it for a while yeah, afterwards yeah but, you know, that's when I knew she was the one. And No, actually, I knew that <laughs> <laughs> before, but it reinforced um, it. There we so go. one other thing that people are always asking me about is just cause it, because I don't necessarily update it that often, but it was some of the first few videos of, like, specialty tanks that I showed off here at the studio, is people ask me a lot about my Christmas tree warm rock tank. Mm. And it gets, like, a, an annual, like, revamp. Where I'm not doing anything to the tank. I just take all the pieces out and I just do a little bit of grooming, rip off some sponge, just kind of reset the plate that they're on and recalibrate the corals yeah. that are in the tank with them. You know, if I had much fewer corals, I would turn it to a lot more aesthetic display. But right now, the worm rocks look amazing, bro. Like, I don't think I've lost um, until yesterday, which I'm going to explain. I don't think I've lost any or maybe like one or two christmas tree dusters that's really good out of like 80 i'm gonna guess like there's like 80 of them across four rocks so yesterday um i cleaned up a lot of like a what i call adjunct growth so there was like um, a bunch of core line growing into a lump on one the back side of one of the rocks there's always like a little bit of valonia i mean after a year i got to clean up a little bit of valonia in between the tubes it's like it's not even tedious at all it's actually when you do that very a little minute amount of picking once a year that's a labor of love (laughs) i'm all about that um what else um i decided so there was this So you got to realize these Christmas tree worm rocks, there's not just like a factory made perfect bundle of the spirobranchus uh, feather dusters and coral, right? It's a piece of live rock that happens to be 80 to 90% corals with some commensals living inside of it. So there's barnacles, there's coral hermits that are cemetery, but they're basically hermit crabs. And then there's all these different colors of Christmas tree feather dusters or worm rocks. And then there are other species of feather dusters. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So they're like, you know, one of the rocks um, is denuded. If, uh, from day one, I didn't have the coral was struggling, but the worms were fine. So that thing's been basically a bare rock for a long time. Um, one piece has parietes and like a couple like Caribbean flower anem- oh, sorry, Pacific flower anemones. They're just two different shades of green. And then one of them had a palathoa growing off the side of it you know like the nasty type but it was just nice enough to save and because Mm. it's like a weirdo palathoa strain that grew off of this rock i decided to preserve it um i started putting it on the under the saw but it just i wish i'd gotten a griffin xl anybody's looking at a a band saw for corals just get the xl don't ever look back i wish i'd gotten the xl there's been so many occasions where if i just had a couple more inches it'd be like such a clean cut but yesterday i decided to cut those off as cleanly as cleanly as possible (coughs) and i knew i was risking a few feather dusters on the side right they had to be removed and if i picked at them really really hard it would probably activate a lot of um palytoxin to be exuded putting me in danger putting the whole rock in danger putting the studio in danger you know so i decided to cut the whole, through the whole thing knowing i was going to cut through a, a few of the christmas tree dusters um because if i let them grow they would just take over that whole rock and that that would be all she wrote but i was yeah. really surprised because i cut through i think three tubes 
and I definitely cut the, the ass end off of one of them because he was kind of hanging out both, <laughs> both sides of his hole, and I think he eventually slipped out. But the others had pulled back into the rock far enough that after the cut, they just came back out. Oh, through really? Through those new holes. So long story short, I, I revamped that, um, that tank. It's like, a, it's, like a, it's like a 30 long, you know, three foot long tank. It's got just nice basic gyre plate in the middle. But it's kind of turned into my um, kind of a, like nicer frags kind of go in there. So I've got um, some oculine in there. I've got my uh, snake polyps, um, a couple of my favorite zoanthids and kind of big lineup of um all of the goniaporas that i have as frags but i say four of them probably ready to graduate out of there and uh i've got like a nicer little small isolation of like fancier galaxia so i've got this really cool galaxia that i had to cut down not too long ago i decided to save every frag and so I have three like single core light frags that just look amazing. It's a gold galaxy with a green, like a bright green mouth. It's one of the nicest glasses. And they're like in between these couple of varieties of branching galaxy. So I've got this, it's a very small little rack, just fancy galaxies on there. So the tank looks amazing, you know? Nice. It's like it, there's not really any algae to get. There was no aptasia problems. There was n very minimal sponge growth. Actually, you know what? The most irritating thing I, we had to remove was some uh, non-pulsing xenia. Anthelia, I don't know. It was, it was one of those octocorals, you know, kind of grayish. And I think we got it all this time. So You got a starky damsel in there too, right? Two of them. Two yep, of them. Two okay, Australian yeah, stark I eyes. I uh, got straight from Quality Marine and... I think you and I know that th that was always such a cool fish. It was like the purple tang of damsels. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember the first one I ever saw in person was when I visited you in uh, South Carolina. And uh, you you helped negotiate with the uh, local fish store manager, <laughs> you know, to get the price down a bit on it. You know, I, I called it my uh, poor man's resplendent angel. Oh, yes. Because yes, it has like that, that true, like, lemon yellow, you know, on them. I mean, and their scales, once they get bigger, their scales are amazing. I need mm. to get one of those. I wonder how he'd fare with my uh, Azure Damsel. I don't know. You only Sometimes have one Azure? Yeah, and, and sometimes with those cryptoras, they they do pick each other off over time. I've noticed. You know, you can get like a, a group of them, mm -hmm. and things will go well for a while, but they'll start to pick each other off, even though they're the nicer of the damselfish. So, I totally forgot. I thought about you when I was um, a Dallas World Aquarium. I hooked up with uh, Joey DIY Fish Keeper and Paula Carson, the curator of the lots of things there. And it was just an awesome time. We were there for like three or four hours, checking out the exhibits, checking out all their birds, all their small mammals, all their the, the plants inside. Like as a plant guy now, like I was noticing like a lot of not rare, but more like exotic level monsteras and philodendrons and anthuriums. And they had this uh, Orinoco crocodile. I had no idea they got that big. There was <laughs> one there that like he'd make short work of eating you not killing you eating you he was uh, 20 feet long it was incredible but they had a lot of rare and exotic fish and that is i think one of the last times i have ever saw true wild uh latissanatus clownfish mm. and they have a, like a lord howe exhibit they used to keep a lot colder. i was about to say that was uh i was gonna let you finish and say i remember back in the day fama i think or one of the fish magazines highlighted them and they showed that they had a lord howe exhibit mm -hmm. and i remember with conspic angels and i was i mean that was my first real exposure in, in a magazine of like oh what kind of angel fish is that they have a large wild pair that looks photoshopped in real life nice but they had at least one wild latezonatus that's the wide bar or blue lip and then there was like three pairs in the back like you know getting it on bringing it on i think they were f1s i was looking at them from the top of the tank and i couldn't see the white bar but they looked a lot better than the funky tonk <laughs> i kept have raised uh latezonatus clownfish that you've mentioned many times here um on the reef therapy podcast yeah i lost my last one the crooked 
deformed mouth and all. Uh, he was my token quarantine tank fish to keep the bio filter going, mm. um, along with a freshwater adapted to saltwater molly, which you gave me that idea. Um, but yeah, that was such a man. I would if I could get my hands on some nice lats that were you know full banded, healthy, wild. You know, those I don't care by. if they're domestic, just as long as they look like the wild type. Yeah. Right? I'm yeah. not, like, stuck on it being pure and wild and F-Zero. I just want it to look like the flawless fish that come from the wild. Mm -hmm. And since we're on this topic, bro, I'm actually going to be writing about a spot synctus clownfish that I saw in an aquarium display at the Dallas airport. And finally, this fish made me realize that there's a story or a conversation to be had about, like... How shitty are we going to let captive bred fish be? I know I'm not making friends right now, but man, this thing had like just like more than a bulldog punched in faced. He had like a big old flared gills. His body wasn't in the right shape. His fins weren't. I mean, obviously the bars is a spot synctus, but man, this thing looked like, like a, a science experiment. It really did. And you see that. I'm just like, I'm, it's just making me wonder what is the bottom Right? What is the floor for the quality of some of these captive raised fish? Because like, man, that fish looked like it was actually hurting to be alive, yeah. to breathe. <laughs> That's how my lats was, man. Uh, the final one, the other one was worse uh, as well, but um, just the crooked jaw, the punched in face, uh, it struggled, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I was, um, the tank it was in, was developing a bubble in the seam so i just you know again it's just a 20 gallon so i went yeah. to pets petco and grabbed another one plopped it in its place moved everything in and uh, a week later it perished and i i could blame myself for disrupting its environment but i mean it was a hot swap right like the the biofilter everything just transferred over the same you know, water probably like, a, probably like an elderly person living on life support you yeah. still move it from one funeral one yeah, you know, uh, what do you call it? Retirement home to another, but just that stress alone was enough to be like, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah, but yeah I don't know. I just, I feel like there's a lot of room between flawless fish and test tube freaks, you know? Yeah. And there's just not enough of a conversation being had of like, what is the baseline that we should accept as a standard for cultured fish? Man, God, I remember the conversation around cultured fish used to be just about price. It was only like the messaging was like, oh, please pay like $5 more, $10 more for a 40 or $50 fish, you know, to support aquaculture. And now it's like the quality is just atrocious. I'm, okay, I'm, some fish are atrocious. No, it's not across the board, but some cultured fish look nothing like their wild counterparts. Yet they're priced at like three, four, five times what you can get them from the wild. You know. Yeah, and like I get that they're still figuring some stuff out because I think marine fish breeding is is still relatively for a lot of species. It's still groundbreaking, right? And they're still uh, ironing out some wrinkles. I mean, I look at biota, right? I ha I have not purchased a captive bred yellow tang. And the reason being, all the ones I've seen in person have weird discoloration issues or lateral line issues, and they may have fixed it by now. They may have figured out what the glitch was. Well, let's, but save, let's save some of this for a future in session yeah, where we just sure. talk about aquaculture. But I think the problem is they're not trying, actually. Because if you look at poly aqua rich fish, they're raised in such a way that they're like except for the fact that they're an impossible hybrid, they're practically flawless, uh, you know, specimens of the species. Very few captive breeding artifacts. And my umbrage is that they're not even trying to make a perfect fish. All right, enough about that stuff. <laughs> but I do want to give a special shout out to uh, David Rains of Galactic Coral. Um, you know, it's just not too often that I come across a new challenge and someone has a lot of answers for me. So he and I actually did a trade on a kind of a rainbow red um, carpet anemone that I got maybe about two months back. Yeah, because that would have been around reef currents time. And ever since then, I've just been spending 
paying a lot more attention to my anemones because they had been in baskets and larger systems doing fine but i just wanted to give them something better so put them in like a one rack of the system which is basically unfiltered just a sponge filter <laughs> over a, a power head that you know pumps water across and the water flows back but now I'm, you know i've got um a big blue carpet the red rainbow red carpet got two green bubble tips one nexus burst one chicago burst two pizza nems one red eye and one reddish malu and i'm just starting to see like this general malaise about that many anemones being in the same system because i've already put it through a few cipro treatments and that seems to help temporarily like just gives them i don't know some kind of crazy spunk i am starting to believe that just it's too much flesh to water ratio for especially for a tank that has almost no filtration so david had talked to me about uh, you know some larger systems where he held like uh, quantities of different anemones and he shared some um, observations about some, some of his tanks and people that he know that when the anemone population reaches a certain size um, they don't seem to do well so this is not one anemone affecting another it's more like just something in the water so it could be bacterial my pet theory is that they're somehow just straight releasing nematocysts in the water because they you know they, they mucus off a lot they slime a lot and so um i've heard that more of some of the more aggressive anemones will you I've, I've heard anecdotal people say you know evidence that people say they will take out you know some of the more milder anemones over time you know mm -hmm. like and and there was this general advice of don't mix in enemies that has has lurked around on the internet for a long time i i think there's something to that but um in talking to david it just he said he knows that this one system where the, some aquarius is keeping like one strain of bubble tips in one tank one strain of bubble tips in another tank another strain in another tank but they're all in the same system and it wasn't until they added a uv sterilizer um, and a lot of carbon that the anemones stop showing just these signs of stress. You know, we work so much more with corals and fish than we do with, like some of these invertebrate groups. So it was just like, I was very happy to find some information that supported my observations. Um, that, so that was pretty cool. But yeah, I have like literally the antidote, the, a the antithesis of, of what these folks are doing. It's just total open water tank, no skimmer, just a tiny sponge filter. So I got to hurry up and uh, put it all in the whole system and just give them, they'll have a protein skimmer, an automatic uh, filter roll, and I'll throw in a little UV on there. I think that's, that's going to be the ticket. That's been a wish list tank for mine is a, is a Hadoni carpet tank mm -hmm. with some clowns, you know, just dedicated tank for it. But, uh, yeah, just have never done it. So, and that rainbow anemone you got is amazing. <laughs> it's that amazing rainbow carpet. it's like not feeling the, the weird proximity of the other anemones. Yeah. But granted, I have a lot of anemones in like 30 gallons of water, no matter how spread out they are, they're not touching. I just, yes, yeah, I think it's reached critical mass. But I'm glad I'm learning all these things about keeping a bunch of anemones together because I'm now like, all right, we got to turn up the system, give them more volume. The thing is, I could keep them in the same exact rack. I could keep them in the same exact rack, but now th then it'll be diluted into 120 gallons overall with auto filter roll, with you know all the things that try to diffuse whatever kind of um, you know either stinging cells or or chemical warfare that's happening purposely or incidentally yeah i told you my um i don't maybe not on the podcast but um i had ordered some um recordia yumas um a few weeks back uh and it was interesting because i put them in my established little propagation slash coral holding quarantine tank you know to look for bad things and I noticed as I was taking them out of the bag of the frag plugs had some dino -y strands uh -oh. on it. Uh oh, uh oh. And I was like, well, whatever. You know, ever since I start went back to keeping my tanks at 81, 82, dinos don't take a hold anymore in my tank. And that's how I got through the whole dino hell. And that tank blew up with dinos. And I was like, man, what the hell? Um, I bumped the temperature up just one more degree and it didn't seem to be doing anything and i was getting kind of frustrating frustrated but then yeah i checked uh two days ago and it was gone i'm like oh, cool. okay so it it 
you know, self-corrected, but it was just interesting that this pioneer, I won't call it an algae, obviously, but this, this kind of thing that people refer to as a um, temporary problem, new tank syndrome, uglies, whatever, back to that discussion of people having persistent issues with them, it came in almost like a pest, right, mm-hmm. on coral and blew mm-hmm. up the whole tank and then eventually it just ran out of steam and died. But there was no changes to the actual tank itself, right? There was no changes to the chemistry, nothing. Uh, no water changes, nothing. So it was interesting. It was just like, hmm, okay. Um, but, you know, I'm glad it happened in that tank. It reinforced my idea of keeping my corals in a little temp tank for just a week or two. Just isolation, observation, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Let that crap work itself out, and now I can put those frags in my main tank. So... Yeah, uh, interesting to share. Speaking of small tanks, you know, there's again, there's been a lot of discussion and about the reef aquarium hobby being very expensive. So, just took the time to put together a sub hundred dollar little nano tank. Yeah, it was so easy. So, I mean, obviously it's easy because the rock was already colonized and everything. So I just plopped it in. Like, okay, you live by yourself now. Um, but yeah, I think I'm super conservative on that one because you could have a 10-gallon tank lying around. You could probably find a lid. You might not have to pay shipping for that stuff. And then you're talking about like a $75 tank. I'm going to stay away from most of my videos, from including the livestock in the, in the final price because it's really subjective. But I will get around to doing a video where I talk specifically about the livestock. And I'll go around a bunch of fish store and just you know, buy off you know, stuff that's just not looking great or that's considered a pest or hell. I mean, there, I mean, there's so much to do in that space. I'm, I'm looking very much looking forward to it. You should do a medium sized tank on a budget. I mean, you'd have to have a little bit more of a budget, but um, I think that would be a really good conversation starter of, um, you know, you can accomplish like a 50 or a 70 gallon tank where you have room to acquire uh, some interesting corals and mm-hmm. keep some interesting variety of fish um, and have amazing looking tank, but really don't need uh, the, the only thing that scales up uh, in my opinion is lighting. Um, yeah. But from a filtration standpoint, you can get away with the same methodology, right? Yeah. Um, but that would be kind of, that that's something that I was thinking of doing, but then I'm, I don't know. I just, I would want to run it for a long period of time and let it develop. And I don't know if I really have the appetite to do that right now. So I will never do that again, except for my forthcoming acro tank (laughs) 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 because, um, I have enough tanks to keep me busy. So that one I want to set up and it's going to be, you know, a lot of flow. So I just want to verify that I'm cool with the aquascape and, uh, you know, 400 gallons of water in the treatment before, but when it's time, man, I'm going to load it up. I'm tired of like cutting these, these stag horns getting too tall. I'm like, all right, this is plant everybody. I think I got a few boxes of a uh, cornerstone rock being shipped to me straight from Aquashella, Dallas or Dallas area. So we're looking forward to that. And it's just, you know, what's funny, dude, like uh, planted aquariums had a booth at Aquashella, Dallas with the tank exactly the same dimensions as mine. And it had, a tank for a sump basically i don't know what it was uh they said something like people were asking for glass sumps and so they just turned one of their 100 gallon tanks into a sump i'm like that's exactly what i want (laughs) i want the i want the four or five foot long glass you know sump filter yeah that's what that's exactly what i want so I'm, i'm really leaning towards finding any container that will fit just to get it going and then having a janky container and having it going is going to motivate me to spec out you know the sump that i actually want to use because i have everything else rocks corals not lights but you know lights can come um but yeah so yeah the the it, the nano iwagumi setup was really fun i was surprised how many people really really got a lot out of it um uh one commenter said they'd never heard of a feather duster worm I was like, all right, yeah, you know, the reef aquarium hobby has gotten, you know, really myopic or just has blinded yeah, on when it comes to, to other reef life. Um, and the only thing that I was a little disappointed about that setup is the light. 
the light. I spec'd out a $25 light that on paper looked really good. Little 10 watt jobby. And when I put it over the tank, dude, it was like barely on. <laughs> it really surprised me because it had a great heat sink. And I could just keep looking at it like, I think if I just rip off those LEDs and grab like an old cluster from, one, from an old light and just hot wire it per se, I think it'll be way, 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 way better. <laughs> but I ended up pulling out a, a little spotlight. But I was just, I was kind of, um, dude, I have every freaking spotlight there is practically. <laughs> I was just surprised that they were either like too warm and white or too cool and blue. And I couldn't find a great light to bring out the, the purples of the purple death, the red of the rhodactus, and the green of the other rhodactus. So now I'm just like, man, there's, and then I've been looking at a bunch of lights. There's this weird middle ground of, you know, 25 to $50 lights that just almost don't exist to get anything okay, like just new. It's like $50, $70. I'm like, yeah, it's kind of blowing my budget. So I'm still looking at some of the other spotlights and seeing if I can shoehorn them to be good enough. You know, if you find something good, let me know, because, um, for giggles, I took my par meter in my little 12 inch tall prop tank, and I have a really, really, really ancient uh, Kessel A350 that you gave me um, over it. And when it's full throttle, directly over a little 20 gallon tank, mm -hmm. I was only getting 90 par. And so Those I'm. First gen 350s and yeah. 150s. Um, God, I haven't even seen a 150 out in the wild in a long time. Um, yeah. Th after after three to five years, understandably, there was a significant reduction in the output. What's funny is, I think if what I've seen most often is you switch that all the way to whites, all of a sudden it's super bright. And it's not from the brightness of the whites. It's because the whites haven't been run nearly as hard uh, as the blues. Yeah. Try it. So just turn down the blues, but turn let the yeah, whites tuna blue it. Tuna blue it to, more, to be more white. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So I, I'm, it's working. It's great. I mean, 90 par is okay for uh, a little holding tank. I do notice my extra frag of the Fox flame macro is not too happy. Mm. Um, even though that coral does seem to like lower par. Uh, but yeah, I need to find something to replace it. I may just do like an A360X or something over it. Cause I do like the pendant, you Dude, know, it's easy nice. to work on the tank and all that. Yeah. But yeah, I just thought that was interesting. I was like, you know, huh, that's a pretty big light for a little tank. So I was surprised at the low par readings. But it is, I have run that thing a lot, you know. Yeah, and uh, I many, ran many it, years. right? I yeah. ran it before you got it. So it's got yeah. a, lot of, a lot of hours on it. It's got some it. miles on it, yeah. Um, yeah, so there's a still a lot of discovery to be left on the truly nano LED lighting space. And it'll just, you know, be fun to find some of those winners for like, you know, 30 to 40 bucks. Um, for some of the future larger setups, because a lot of people were asking about, you know, do a $200 tank. I'm like, all right. What I think I'm going to do is actually transfer <laughs> what I currently have in that 10 gallon tank, put it into a five gallon tank, because it's just, there's just a lot of open room. I'm like, it doesn't need to be that Iwagumi style, you know, or it's just a fine layer of sand and just one rock. It doesn't need to go lean into that so hard. Gotcha, yeah. All right, well, I got a couple news headlines uh we could you know gab about for a minute before we get to the what everybody's waiting for the meat and potatoes um with some good insights so the first one is man i've been i've oh god i am used up on writing stories about um different coral uh, fish markets getting shut down you know fiji australia Indonesia, Indonesia again, back and forth, yada, yada. And they just, I just, I mean, it just wore me out. So there's been a looming deadline for uh, corals in Queensland specifically. Um, so that's one of the states of Australia, but that's the state that has most of the Great Barrier Reef on it, where most of our corals are collected and harvested. And I, man, I don't know all the ins and outs. There's like too much stuff going on right now to fully wrap my head around it. Uh, so shout out to Jeremy Gay for doing that write up. You're a real mate. <laughs> You're a real mate, bruv. He wrote, he wrote it up on Reef Builders and dissected all the information because I got one email that had like seven PDFs and each PDF like linked to other PDF. And it was like, oh man, I'm not going down that rabbit hole. That's too much right now. But long story short, they, they have a new system in place um, with reduced quota 
that gives them till 2024. It's not that's not an end date, but that they just have a respite from now till you know three years from now to keep doing what they're doing and hopefully you know uh, enact or keep um, logging and monitoring their own actions. I don't know exactly. Definitely go read their story on Reef Builders, but long story short, um, Queensland corals can continue to be harvested and exported for now. How, I, you know, I, I, I read the article, but I, I didn't see it in there, and, and maybe you don't have the answer directly in front of you, but um, how does the new quota limits compare to either previous limits or just the, the number that was collected previously annually I'm just curious to see if, you know, uh, even though the corals are still being allowed to be collected, if, you know, the limits are going to impact availability to some degree or price or, you know. Oh, you know. You know it will. Yeah. You know, you see corals that used to ship, like a whole colony that used to export for like $30. Now that colony is cut into six pieces and each piece is export pricing for like $45. And now the shipping's crazy, you know. Mm -hmm. So that every time there's like a market squeeze, <laughs> every time, man, people up the chain, they just send you smaller corals for more expensive. But on the flip side, since they they can't handle as many corals, they now have a a higher bar set, you know. So I guess you know by 2035, they'll only be able to harvest. 100 corals and every one of those is going to cost twenty thousand dollars but they will knock your freaking socks off <laughs> yeah. that's where we're going to right now but um yeah i don't think i remember it was, it was twenty thousand kilograms of acropora and which i'm like all right well that seems kind of all right because a one kilogram colony of acro is going to be cut up a few different ways but there was another one that was kind of massive and i don't remember what it was and there was only like seven or eight hundred kilograms of it i'm just like oh i think it was duncan i don't know why it was even on there like you'd think that'd be like a weed and i think it was like don't quote me on this i think it was a thousand kilograms of duncan i'm like all right 500 colonies <laughs> which again now are going to be cut up even smaller and smaller and they've already been selling them by the polyp for many many years but um i'm i'm, I'm glad it's just not dr a dramatic change i'm sure it feels yeah. like it for the guys collecting and their quotas and everything but um oh well that's it's it's happened it is it is past yeah and you know some good that might come out of it is some of these corals like duncan's instead of doing chop shop on wild colonies it you know if the value shifts then maybe there's more um value in in the aquaculture route with something like that because that, that's a fast growing coral i mean relatively right it's sort of like candy cane and everything else it no it's not heads. like candy cane it's not like candy cane it grows steadily i wouldn't say it grows fast yeah i felt like it did but you know i don't know i i keep things for a long time and ignore them so <laughs> you know, it's, mm -hmm. i look at it and go oh yeah that's that thing went from two polyps to ten polyps but um but yeah i mean uh, maybe maybe more in line with like a blasto in terms of growth um mm -hmm. but yeah it's you know it's not the end of the world at least well what is the end of the world though is the diseases spreading through and killing everything that's not an acro in the caribbean and this has been you know an alarming oh, decimation of coral populations in the caribbean and i know a lot of you know those corals have already been not all of them, obviously, but a lot of them have been plucked from the ocean and put into like aquarium arcs like we've been talking about for freaking 30, 40 years. Now the scientists are just giving it a crack. <laughs> it's just they're going to be, you know, the experts here soon uh, without too much inclusion from the aquarium hobby. They will have single handedly saved the corals. But now um, so there was a story this week about a coral ointment to be applied to corals that suffer like the slow necrotic tissue loss out in the ocean and you know at first i'm like oh man that's that's pretty cool i want to learn more about this treatment but then i went to go look at the price and you're just like what is happening what's going on right here so man i don't know if there's just like one or two decimal places off but a a 400 gram jar of this ocean ointment, that's what they call it, or coral ocean, ocean coral ointment, 
Coral Cure Ointment Base 2B. So I know they did a lot of trials, but I'm pretty sure that was with tax money, right? Tax dollars of researchers working at public aquariums. Everything's publicly funded. But some group called Ocean Alchemists, somehow they, they went straight to a pharmaceutical company to find this elastomer that could be applied to the the perimeter of corals where they're receding and if you incorporate a amoxicillin into it um it releases the antibiotic for like three days and stopping the infection with like 86 percent rate so it's not even like this miracle cure but the cost to treat 20 meters that's 60 feet of reef is 346 dollars that's not counting anybody's time to go down there and actually do the thing. That's not counting the boat time or gas tank fill or the uh, air tank fills or the salaries of people to go out there and like fix the reef. So to fix 2000 meters of, or to treat 2000 meters. So a little more than a mile of, you know, coral edging, um, that's $15,000 for this stuff. And I just, I don't really understand because Ocean Alchemist, they're working with some pharmace pharmaceutical company. Um, and again, I went down this rabbit hole, but forgot the exact parties. And for some reason, the shipping of 400 grams is $150. Is it, is the problem the elastomer that they're getting from the pharmaceutical company and the pharmaceutical company is, you know, either the product is expensive or, you know, that that's what I'm wondering. Is it is it um, the part of getting into bed with a pharmaceutical company because you needed something that allows the amoxicillin to persist, right? And that might be some trade secret, whatever, that this sure. company has a, sure, a patent Sure, but why on. does it cost $150 to ship 400 grams? Well, yeah. <laughs> that's like, I mean, I'm looking at a spreadsheet right now. It says approximate cost of shipping, $150. For 400 grams uh, for one jar and you're just like is this like nitroglycerin or plutonium because i don't understand how a pound of anything costs 150 dollars to ship anywhere <laughs> anywhere you know um, does it have to be frozen like the pfizer vaccine you know like I, they gotta I, I, ship I it on dry it, ice or? i think it does need to be refrigerated yeah but that doesn't even include the cost of the antibiotic and i'm just like man there's something fishy here and the fact that they, again, like you said, kind of like partnered up with a pharmaceutical company and they went to those people's people and said, this is the thing that we need to do this other, this, this task. And yeah, maybe it's something funky. And I'm just over here thinking, I'm wondering like if there's like an Alonzo's oil situation. So I don't know if you remember this movie from the nineties mm -hmm. um, where it was dramatized, right? So I'm not sure how true it was, but there was a different treatment that cost $12 or like $20,000 that kept people's lives, kept people alive with a rare um, a neurological disease. Um, and I'm just over here, like when I saw the price and what it's trying to do, I'm like, did they try petroleum jelly? <laughs> did they just try? Cause they need some substance to apply to the perimeter of corals that are receding to, to also will release this, this, this media. So I'm, I'm, I have some confidence that if I drill down, it's not as bad as it sounds. And the optimist in me is actually trying to focus on the fact that just the very concept of using something like, let's say, epoxy or super glue or mixed with um, uh, a treatment of some kind, there's got to be some applications in the aquarium hobby when you have something that's receding really slowly. We already kind of do this to some degree, right? With our super glue band aids. Mm -hmm. minus the whole bacteria stuff so what if what if the, the the tissue loss disease in caribbean could be fixed just by like big old pipes of freaking super glue you could literally just super glue around the thing there's no way it's going to cost 350 dollars to treat 60 feet <laughs> did they even read like any aquarium like treatments for like what we do when we have coral loss you know i think w when you see this price i just I can't help but think that someone knows that this is going to be paid for by government money, by tax dollars. 
And they literally, in some of the press releases, they, they say proprietary ointment. At least they tell you they're using amoxicillin. It's just, I don't know. But it, it got my gears turning about, well, hmm, maybe we could do something like that with, uh, you know, for uh, aquarium corals on a larger scale. Like, say you had a chalice that was receding a little bit and you gave it a couple of treatments, you didn't know what to do. Um, yeah, maybe there's something there. You can just be able to kind of button it down with something that has a antibiotic uh, actually mixed into it. And so that's the, the, the side I was trying to focus on. I was like, ooh, this could be a, a really cool technique. I, yeah, I'm, I'm generally a very positive guy. So when I say pessimistic things, I, I don't mean to sound negative. But um, I just, you know, again, I go into deep thought territory sitting on my porch drinking a beer. And um, some of the stuff I read about, like these feel-good articles, I, I kind of feel like... <sighs> I don't know. It's it's like um, we have this house and it's killing all the kitties inside, all the cats. So we went and we we like f it's like you're not fixing what's wrong with the house. You're you're just like these coral transplants, right, and stuff like that. I don't get me wrong. Like I'm a big believer in you know don't let the fact that we can do e that we cannot do everything stop us from doing something, right? I, I respect that, but it's like patching corals with antibiotics because they're dying in large numbers in this ecosystem to me is like a band-aid and it's, um, where does it all end? You know, that, that's always been my question is like, oh, uh, this weather reef completely bleached out and died, but we're going to transplant new corals there. I'm like, okay. And what happens when the temperature rises again? It's just it feels a little bit like a money grab because of the urgency because we can't fix the environment now But maybe we can save some of these corals today and for sure Uncle Sam or some local or state governments there there. I mean there's gonna be um, Hundreds of thousands of dollars thrown at this technique, you know, whether it really works in the field or not right, so no matter what like somebody a lot of money's can change hands and it just who will who knows what will actually happen like who's going to really profit from it you know the pharmaceutical company it would literally cost them a ton of money to create this last omer and ocean alchemist is not really taking it off the, off the top and they're really trying to help people out like either way like there's going to be a lot of money pumped into the problem and you know at the end of the day well there's gonna be another disease next year and then <laughs> 10 years and then the reef is gonna be you know eroded or drowned by a high sea well you know you just never know yeah I, I again i i commend the effort and you know doing what you can to keep things afloat and pre preserved and surviving there's nothing wrong with that but i just don't know what the end game is ultimately and that mm. that's what is a depressing thought but i mean goes through my head right it's like the guy down the street buys a prius and thinks he's saving the planet but he has four kids yeah uh well I, again i'm trying not to know? get incensed by yeah, the, yeah, yeah. that part yeah. of it and thinking to myself hmm petroleum jelly i could maybe i could uh mix up a little chemicline in there some erythromycin or some other antibiotic and put it in like little patches on corals that i can't exactly take out of the tank I can see the tourism benefit, right? I mean, if there's reefs that... Tourists aren't going to see corals. Oh, I come am. on, like Pennington State see, Park and all that, right? They're I going mean, to see sea turtles. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to see sea turtles and a few token fish. And yeah, that's. but if the coral dies, a lot of the, the fun things people want to see go away too, dude, right? I was on so. Pennicamp Reef and 15 years ago. There was virtually no coral there. Yeah, like, there was a few sea fans or Gorgonians. <laughs> it's, it's pretty depressing. I've been there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now we come to the big news of the hour. This is kind of a long one. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, what's funny is how many people try to read the tea leaves and just threw out like wild guesses about what was going to happen next in the, um, the acquisition uh, trend that's happening right now. And um, so I'm just going to recap what's uh, been happening for the listeners who may not be fully abreast of uh, what's transpired this year. Um, but there's an investment group called Bertram Capital. And back in February, they acquired Bulk Reef Supply. And that was what I call the, like, the opening salvo where 
you know, the, the team BRS just said they, you know, they really want to grow the market and expand their business and better help people and just grow the company in a way that they couldn't do organically like they had been for a few years. Yep. So then for almost half a year, everything kind of stayed mostly the same in the, in the foreground. Um, they did acquire a bunch of talent here and there, um, you know, uh, absorbing people uh, in the industry with a lot of experience and a wide range of talents. And uh, then the shocker, which we've already talked about, is uh, back in June, um, people said Bulk Resupply bought Marine Depot. And that's kind of, that was kind of the narrative at the time. But um, Marine Depot had been struggling for a little while. So they, I think they bought a lot of emails, newsletters, YouTube uh, content, and some of their people. So that was in June. And then like just about a month later, um, their first major acquisition was the um, purchase of Neptune Systems. And that's what really kind of sparked people's um, interest to try to uh, you know, predict the future. The Nostradamus effect. If you guess enough times, you're going to get it right. Um, so it's worth noting, I don't know how many people are aware of this, but a, a few weeks ago, you know, uh, Terence Fugazi, who had been the figurehead of Neptune Systems and, you know, really uh, brought them into the, the current era, um, he departed the organization a few weeks back. It, there was really not much discussion about it, just a lot of surprise. And then, so yesterday, November 2nd, um, the acquisition slash merger with Ecotech Marine was announced you know, so now we've we've got what I'm calling kind of a super group with uh, Neptune Systems, Bulk Resupply, Ecotech Marine. And uh, the reason we talked about this last, because my pet peeves about this whole issue or this whole episode, not our episode, just what's, what's happening, is that people are spending so much time talking about it. And there's a, already a plenty of previous examples where people spun their wheels on a topic and at the end of the day it doesn't change your how chemistry works in your tank it doesn't change how you're gonna have to manage aptasia in your reef aquarium it doesn't change what you need to know and learn about like lighting up your corals or flowing up your rocks feeding your fish doing your water changes and i just i mean i feel like there's a subset of probably every hobby uh, with hobbyists that spend way too much time talking about it than actually doing it. But, I mean, we are a culture where we get into flame wars about bare bottom versus sand, right? So I think the the topic That's different. Was, that is different. That's at least technique, you're, yeah, at it's least methodology. You're, at least but you're furthering some arguments towards a common goal. But what was I, your I, thought when you first heard about this? Um, so I agree the gossip is overboard or the speculation, I guess, is overboard. Um, I, when they bought Marine Depot, I, it was, if you're in the business to grow, it made sense, right? Um, it made sense that, uh, and, you know, I know, like, we can get into the, kind of confusing state because a lot of people talk about bulk reef supply being the buyer versus Bertram. Uh, my impression is that bulk reef supply is probably advising Bertram on some things. Who knows? Maybe they're not. But um, in the end, that doesn't matter, right? It, it's if you are investing in a bulk reef supply and there's a struggling competitor that you have an opportunity to buy at a good price, that made sense. I think when Neptune happened, that was a bit of a left turn for a lot of people where mm -hmm. cuz it wasn't just like business business it was also brands and products and not yeah, just Yeah, it was vertical integration, right? Yeah. It's um we now own something that we sell. Um and then they doubled down with Ecotech and I don't think it's I yeah, I mean again, going back to deep thoughts on the porch, I certainly have <laughs> some concerns about it, but not like, I wouldn't even call them concerns, right? I, I, I have some of my own speculative thoughts of where, again, where does this all end, right? But nobody knows, right? So so it's not, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't, I, I'm not gonna lose sleep over it. 
I do feel like um, I feel like when you're in a room and and there's all these voices about companies and product direction, right? There's really loud voices about innovation and ways that you know they can do things in new markets or in ways to be more competitive. And there's voices in the room on you know how do we increase our profitability? How do we make production more streamlined and make it more efficient and uh, make our net revenue better, right? Um, and the 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 only problem is is like the the whole tagline of um, less competition is good for the consumer you know because now we have synergies between the companies and we can innovate more i believe that's true right i think we're gonna see hopefully ecotech products play nicer with neptune and vice versa that would be cool um i got some, I got some points on that yeah but um less competition inevitably makes some of those innovation innovation voices over time maybe not immediately in my opinion probably quieter in the room and from a capital investment point of view, when you are competing against less entities for for your dollar, right? Buy this light instead of our light, or buy our light instead of their light. Um, does that continue to push innovation as being the most important thing in the room? Or does the, how do we make things more efficient, more, uh, how do we make manufacturing more affordable on our end and we can continue to charge X and we can bring home more net revenue? Those voices do tend to get a little bit louder. And then the ethical piece of, I've heard them talk about how they love their local fish stores and they don't want to see local fish stores go out of business who are also selling a lot of these products by Neptune, Ecotech, uh, Aqua Illumination. Um, and I believe that, you know, the spirit of the BRS guys is good. Mm -hmm. But uh, but there's another voice in the room now, right? And that's Bertram. And um, I know they were chosen because they had the most reasonable voice out of all the folks that wanted to invest. But again, eventually decisions that are fiscally smart, um, whether they're good long term from a consumer perspective, are going to have credence in those conversations they're going to have value right they're going to be and, right, and before, again i don't want to get in well hold on i don't want to get into speculation right but because that that's the problem is that now you could speculate well they could do this and that would make them more or money or but it would suck for us but we don't know you know or you could we do know we i mean for now like so it's seven years ago february 2014 ecotech marine merged with aqua illumination we already yeah. have. I mean, obviously, this is not as huge of an example as what's happening now, but we already but have. But they didn't like sell directly to the consumer. I mean, they've got parts and accessories. But okay, I mean uh, vertical integration aside, though, but we already have this at least one pre-existing example of Ecotech Marine essentially acquiring AI. I know it was a merger of, of resources and stuff, but the brand only got stronger. It got better True. you know there's been multiple generations the price has stayed the same with the feature set just getting better and better they you know really pushed with the first like kind of router enabled cloud control of uh not the first but probably the first that most people are familiar with with the, the ai hyperdrive uh series that had ai fi i think there that's the word i was looking for but nothing really changed um the lights got better they came in white and black. Their mounting offering got a little bit better. And then, you know, Ecotech Marine's experience with water pumps was used to develop the Neros, which are already like being copied at Infinitum and created a kind of a new product category within the propeller pumps that people freaking love, you know? And so when, when it, let's just, you know, it's but important that made to sense have to that me because for the conversation, though. It's important to have that at, for the conversation before we look at the, the greater picture of the vertical integration and selling the products that you want. Yes, there, no. that is, that is a, a tricky yeah. one. To your point, um, if you buy something that has a good brand, it's not in your interest to destroy that brand, right? You had Dragon. Team AI, you had Team Ecotech, like in, in the consumer space, right? Honda so Lexus. Yeah, and... and 
you know, you're going to have people that prefer an AI light over an Ecotech light, or they're just more brand loyal. So it was a brand that had a very good reputation and a, and a strong following. So it didn't make sense to kill it, right? Uh, to me, you, you grow that brand in parallel. So, I so love yeah. what they've done with it as far as making the Radeon, uh, you know, a little bit more premium and a yeah. um, little higher power and more diffused, right? They made it like a, a blanket of light, whereas the clusters of the Prime and the Hydras just got smaller and smaller and smaller within the same form factor. That was really cool. Um, but yeah, we're right around the corner. I think some users of Mobius Beta already have um, control of AI products like Hydras and Mobius within, oh, sorry, uh, Hydras and Nero's within Mobius. So that's that's really, really cool. But a lot of people don't even know that they're, you know, essentially the same company. And uh, yeah, you know, like, I, I don't know. I, I really feel like this is for the best. Um, <laughs> somebody said this was a jab and I did not mean it as a jab. But when um, Bird Valkyrie Supply says they want to grow the hobby and that's why they took this money, yada, yada, yada. You know, in my mind, I'm like, ah, I think they kind of just want to go public and just, you know, build something grand and big and and massive. But when the Ecotech Marine says analogous things, like I really believe them because I've known the guys um, forever, forever since, you know, since they launched the first Vortec pump. And I know that a lot of the challenges that they've faced over the last 10 years was producing the products that were already available, right? And that one of the few things that disincentivized them from making new products is they could never catch up. Well, not never, but they just, they were always running to catch their own tail. They were always running to fill orders, to expand, 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 just to build the existing catalog of water pumps. You know, I mean, don't you think we should be on a Vortec 45 by now? Right, the MP40s, uh, their legacy pump, it has been updated, let's just say twice, right? Because there was one initial kind of optimization to the old wet side, and then they made an MP10 style wet side for the MP40. So, you know, and then the new controller called the Quiet Drive. So, you know, we did kind of in pieces end up arrive at a, f a fully revamped Vortec, but I'm sure those guys with, you know, a lot more resources, we'd have a. Vortec 45 or 41 and a Vortec 61 or 65, a, you know, MP15 or something, you know, something like that. Well, really, I know they would love to, to iterate on that stuff if they could. But even as a large company, when you can barely keep up with the demand and orders for what already exists, it's hard to just justify being like, okay, we're going to can this product line and then create or this product model and then create a whole new one that that's not business sense unless you're just looking ahead to stay ahead of the competition i look i i want to again i'm not i don't want to get into the the um you know forecasting the future because i don't know yeah i i hope that they look at those brands as being um valuable in their own entities right and and so you just keep growing those brands and then you build some synergies i ho and i because i would love to use a versa infusion <laughs> right i'm not too fond of the dose pumps much better um, yeah for sure and i've you know as a guy who never did water changes i'm kind of having fun with automated water changes but i would like a better solution to do that um so so yeah i'm i'm excited about some of those synergies um and I'm also excited that, you know, companies like Ecotech don't have to chase their own tail. I'm just curious, you know, if are we going to stick with the same rhetoric if they buy an aquarium manufacturing company, if they get into the livestock business? Like, I'm just curious, like, are we all still going to clap? Getting, in, getting into the products and the selling and the content creation, I think that's all still dry. So... Man, I don't have a crystal ball either, but I don't see them getting into livestock because the you, you just so much less bankable. You know, it's I mean, you could do your own aquaculture facility and you could still have like a pest, you know, a wave of pests just pass through and just burn up all your crop, you know. And uh, but how many? Okay, how many dry good brands can they buy before? I guess you become a little bit skeptical. I'm not even worried about it. I totally expect them to. By incorporate, more. incorporate 
a, a brand of consumables, you know, additives and salt. It would be silly not to, to, to have that whole package. Totally expect them to create or start their own um, uh, acquiring brand. Like be, that seems like a shoe in no matter what they do. Um, but kind of going back to the uh, interoperability, I think it's just in some ways it's like, this is like a reverse divorce. Like I don't know, I don't know how many people are really aware of just the campiness that occurred between the Neptune Systems, you know, controller fanboys, give me that gray and orange, and then uh, everybody else, you know, uh, especially the Ecotech Marine side. And no matter what you thought about either side, now we're all in the one big happy family. <laughs> and I, I know that I the was, companies will be. The companies was, will be uh, siloed for a while. The, yeah, yeah, and that, that's why I think short term, I don't think it's going to change much. I, I think it's 10 years later where the mission statements start to shift a bit. But I was really excited at the prospect of one day Ecotech uh, coming out with um, the, 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 the finishing pieces to make them essentially a controller ecosystem to take on Neptune and I'm a Neptune user, right? I love my Neptune. I love fusion. Um, but I, I'd like to see that kind of jostling between the two and them pushing each other. Um, and hopefully behind the scenes, the synergies and the integration actually sort of pushes things forward in the same cadence. Mm -hmm. um but yeah that was one of uh, that was one thing where it's like well are we ever going to see what ecotech can do in the controller space or I is think it more I have those answers so okay. i'm actually traveling eco to bethlehem pennsylvania next week and i had this stuff planned to go do some like mega collabs sending them some corals like for months so this this just <laughs> the timing of my trip it's like they almost closed the deal for me i'm not that vain but it's great yeah. timing so next week i'm gonna sit down with them and i'll have like the, the real one-on-one -on -one and um, we'll find out a little bit more, but I, I'm sh certain that the companies will remain you know, mostly siloed in terms of operations for a while for, for the foreseeable future. But like some really easy steps is now that the, the beef is essentially squashed. Um, I think we could see a, a module that allows the Neptune systems uh, platform to control, you know, M Mobius en enabled devices really quickly. Or um, I think now that they have cloud Wi Fi, you know, control of Ecotech Marine products, it could be as simple as a cross platform handshake. You know, like it might not even need any hardware. I don't know what's the best implementation, but I do know that those two things are possible. And I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, it's less than six months before something like that comes out. Right, they don't have to be married to each other. You right, like this peg doesn't have to go in this hole. But these simple things, um, like the smart communication handshake or whatever, I think we could see that sooner than later because it doesn't cost anybody anything except for a little bit of coding time. I say that. <laughs> I say well, that. Well, and a if you can bring developers from both sides into mm -hmm. a room, right? Give yeah. them some some Zoom calls and and let them start sharing more. Because they don't have these, you know, com competition things like keeping them from talking to each other. But like, so I'm going to go a little bit out on a limb here. Like, I know the Ecotech guys are doing well, right? They've been doing well for a while. They're pretty well established in Bethlehem, in their towns. And so what I mean by that is I don't think they're motivated by more money. I think they really want to finish the mission or at least get it to a stage of completion that they can feel good about, you know, this um, journey that they started on. And so I really do believe that they are motivated by the resources. Like, all right, for example, there's this massive chip shortage happening right now, and they've been um, searching for comparable chips to use in the controllers and lights and things. But every time they find one that they can actually buy that's not the stock one, they have to like rebuild the, the PCBs, they really have to rewrite the code, and they have to do all this work just to keep the engine humming where it had been before the chip shortage. So they're doing all this work and making no progress. And you can imagine how much stress it, the owners of any company experienced over the last you know, 15 months or whatever with all this uncertainty. And so for them to be able to buy into uh, you know, a larger piece of you know, commercial inertia. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't blame them. 
you know, but like one perfect example of how more resources should allow them to create more and more diverse products is like a lot of folks who visited <laughs> Ecotech Marine over the years had, had seen the prototype versus just running in some of the workshop rooms. Those things were like the least guarded secret in, you know, the aquarium uh, grapevine, basically. <laughs> I think it was running forever and ever and ever. And so like, for sure, if like this deal had happened back then, dude, the verses would be, there'd be like multiple different models of verses <laughs> by now, right? They'd be so well established and they still can't keep track of production now with the chip shortage. And so I say it was in um, developmental limbo and now it's in production purgatory. And I've even seen verses go for, you know, brand new for 300 on eBay. I don't know if anybody's actually paying that, but imagine if they had the kind of resources they're about to have access to now. And I under, I, my understanding, again, don't take this as gospel, is that it was more of a buy-in than a sell-out. They don't have overlords. They will have a corporate daddy, <laughs> you know, like uh, uh, John Oliver likes to talk about on Last Week Tonight. So, you know, there's, they'll have to enter some folks, but I feel, I think they're going to be able to do what they do. And I just, I mean, I'm looking forward to just, just seeing a lot more Ecotech Marine products because they just haven't disappointed. Yeah, like, I mean, I said from the start, it's nothing that I'm going to lose sleep over. It's more just it'll be interesting to observe over time, right? Um, I, I, you know, I don't, I think the gossip is, or the speculation on, on forums that I go to is a bit out of control. But at the same rate, I don't want to discount their emotions about it because mm -hmm. I can see there being... I can understand some of their concerns as a consumer. I, I, I do. I, I'm not going to discount that. And you can say, well, like, let's see how it all plays out or we should trust them. And I think a lot of people were when Neptune happened and then Ecotech just sparks it all over again, right? And so that was my question is if they buy three more companies, like when, when – uh, when do you start to say, well, how, you know, what are, what are the long-term implications of this? What are right? they worried and about? Are they worried that LED lights are going to continue to cost $1,000 a piece? Are they worried about that MP40s are going to continue to cost like $400 freaking dollars? Because we've been paying top dollar for the, you know, basically like the Teslas of aquarium products, the I Apple of aquarium products. Oh, wait, wait, wait. And these guys have nailed and cornered the premium space. Like, what do you think they're going to do? You know, they've worked so hard to create their own assembly lines and SMTs in house in America to produce their own products to keep the quality high. You think they're going to offshore all that stuff? Like uh, that's no, they, no, they have I the don't, premium I don't market cornered and they're going to continue to do that. If anything, a lot of their, their know-how is going to trickle down into um, mid-range and budget-level aquarium devices. That would be my prognostication. Uh, yeah, I, I think I don't discount, or I'm mean, sorry, that's not the word. I don't doubt the intent or motives of Ecotech people, bulk resupply people, Neptune people. Um, I just, what I'm trying to say is there's another voice in the room, right? that ha is incentivized by different things. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's nothing wrong with what they're incentivized with. Um, you know, there's a million ways that Neptune can make more money that I don't, I would not like, right? right. A subscription model for Fusion, right? Now I gotta pay a monthly subscription to use shh, the Fusion shh, app. Shh, that would piss me off. <laughs> oh, they, believe me somebody's brought that up before and if they haven't then hire me um, but, <laughs> um that's an example where it's like hey that would be that would probably make bertram pretty happy but and and you know what's annoying is i'd probably pay it right and i'd be pissed off about paying it um <laughs> 99 a year just like icloud <laughs> yeah you know it's like my i got the aero mesh oh get aero secure for 100 bucks a year and you know so the subscription model has gone rampant in in our world right um there's just examples like that where i start to think like okay like how does this play out with local fish stores right Again, I don't want to. I don't want to assume that bad things are going to happen because I don't know the future. But it's a good question, right? Mm -hmm. um, I remember when um, 
Uh, well, I can use ORA as an example or uh, a guitar company where they said, look, uh, you have to buy X number of our guitars to continue to sell our brand. And that put all the mom and pops stores in the world, music stores in the world are hurt. And the only people that could meet that demand and keep selling their instruments was like Guitar Center, these large chains, right? Mm -hmm. um, what happens to like the mom and pop stores if they were to do something? Like, again, I'm actually, I said I wouldn't so speculate, I but I'm it. just saying like, what are they worried about? I think they're worried about decisions that are driven by increasing the bottom line that you know, it might not be great for the consumer. And again, I I want to believe that this is all good and synergies and cool. I can control my Vortec and Neptune, yay. But I, I don't want to discount. I, I think that, the like I said, the posts have gotten out of control and like, yeah, focus on your tank. Don't worry about the future. Don't worry about things you can't control. That's, but that's I also don't want to discount saying. their emotions, right? Like I sort of get where they're coming from, where they're kind of like, hmm, how does this play out? I get that, you know, um, but I would say that, you know, I joined the aquarium industry, like, born with a baptism of fire, because when I first got into the aquarium hobby, and like my first aquarium job, I mean, we're talking, this was like two weeks after the ban on the harvest of Caribbean live, live rock. And I, I, I'm very familiar with this sky is falling narrative. And 25 years later, the hobby's still not shut down, right? I don't you know, I, I will definitely put my foot down when there's certain facts and details that I feel very strongly about. But when it comes to like the, the sky's falling idea, I just, I've seen people get worked up about politics, about vaccines, about a shutting down of the industry, and now about this. And at the end of the day, it's just like, it's a lot of huffing and puffing and not nearly enough conversing on how to get rid of dinoflagellates once and for all. <laughs> but I mean, okay, like I don't own a fish store, so I don't have a horse in the race. I'm not betting on a horse. I don't work in the industry like you do. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't care, right? Like I don't. I do care, but like I, it's not going to majorly impact my life. If tomorrow wild corals are banned, then I'll just keep aquacultured clownfish and I'll just keep trucking. Like I, I'm okay. But let's just say they buy uh, worldwide corals, or they they get into the livestock business and they get into the aquarium business and they get into the everything business. Um, are local fish stores still an ally for them? Let's say, let's take two hypotheticals. If I was a you know, current reef store owner and Bulk Reef Supply launched its own brand of pumps, lights, additives, whatever, I would not be freaking thrilled. Uh, you know, that would not <laughs> be my jam. And they sell you know? fish and coral. And I, I, Well, let's just, just say, let's stick with the you know, private labeled goods because yeah. now they have Aquamax from when they bought Marine Depot. So I would not be on board with that. I would be like, yeah, no, I'm not doing that. But then when you're talking about brands like Neptune Systems, like Ecotech Marine, like Aqua Illumination, that are just so entrenched with the DNA of the modern reef aquarium hobby in North America, um, those customers, they come into a local fish store just straight asking for it. They just straight asking for it. They know they can order it, but they know that there's also a map price. And I know that stores that stock the stuff, they sell the stuff whether or mm -hmm. not they use it right so it's just like it's uh you know <laughs> don't throw the baby out with the bother ba baby bath out water. with the bathwater scenario this but when 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 customers come in asking for these established brands but if it, you know if it was reversed if like brs was trying to launch their own brands that'd be a, a much harder sell and i get what people are upset about and but and, and I, look, I, again, I'm not losing sleep. I'm just giving you some either, devil's yeah. advocate. To, now, we, we uh, went into this know. knowing I was going to be a good cop. You're going to be a yeah, bad cop. Yeah. Because um, we want to, so, you know, inject the balance. Yeah. You know, um, the, the, the hobby is so mature that, man, if Ecotech Marine, AI, Neptune Systems, they misstep or their higher ups, you know, force them into decisions they're not thrilled about. There's just countless examples of people leaving those organizations to start their own company. True. You know, yeah. like Spectrum, Spectrum Brands, you know, bought up, uh, um, let me try to get this right, Omega C, Marineland, Aquarium Systems, US, and a couple others. And, you know, at least a couple of those guys you know, fractured off and formed Cobalt Aquatics. 
you know, to get a little bit closer and in tight in with the reef aquarium, with their uh, audience within the aquarium hobby market. So, you know, I, again, it's not the end of the world. There is legitimate, you know, long-term concerns about how things look five years down the road. But I really feel strongly that at least in the medium terms, the next three to five years are going to be very exciting. I don't I, think we're going to I, I see agree. I think short term, the synergies and innovations will be very exciting. Um, and again, at the end of the day, it's we're talking about aquarium lights and controllers. They're not mm. going to. This isn't going to ruin my life. Um, if nothing I else, we can just buy current generation. Like you know, five, ten years from now, yeah. we'll be like looking for those you know new inbox, never used Gen fours and Gen oh, 5 you radions. got the you got some <laughs> pre BRS uh, Ecotex, <laughs> dude. You know how much those are worth? No. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I just mean when the group hugs and the, like, let's print some T-shirts, like, uh, when all of that fades in 10 years and, you know, Bertram Capital, and when the COVID thing ends and, you know, all these, I mean, all these hobbies have gotten out of control because everyone's at home, right? Like, it, the ho this hobby benefited greatly. Um, but, you know, when, when life somehow goes back to normal, like, if, if this hobby loses steam, I'm just interested to see how it plays out, and it could all be great, and you know, I mean, between whatever. you and me, this hobby's not losing steam. Like we've seen it, seen it grown from like this super oddball niche, where the biggest conference of the year could only attract like 80 people, to now there's innumerable conferences with thousands and thousands of people, you know, every year. So I don't think it's going to go back. I, but, uh, yeah, I, I think I think we'll be all right. I think we'll, we'll be all right. It'll be, it'll be, at the end of the day, it'll be interesting to observe um, the people that are like, oh, I'm not, I'm, I deleted my bulk grief supply account. Like, I, I'm not on that camp, right? I, I, uh, I like their videos. I like the, um, I like buying stuff from them. I like Ecotech. I like AI. I love my Neptune. I, I got, you know, I'm just playing devil's advocate that, you know, sometimes, you know, y it's interesting to watch. And I, I do think there's some, yeah, it'll be interesting to observe. And if I was a local fish store owner, I might be a little bit like WTF about it all. Um, but um, yeah, wait. They are the ones who have skin in the game. They are the ones who should be the most vocal about it. They, if they want to voice a lot of, uh, you know, extreme concerns, go for it. But m these conversations are not being had primarily by retail and business, yeah. you know, aquarium business owners, it's hobbyists just getting wound up, you know, foaming at the mouth about what could happen. To be honest, not even the people involved have a crystal ball to know. Well, I was going to say really the other side down. of that coin is um, that's a big undertaking to integrate those companies, right? And to build those synergies and, and to build a roadmap on how, what, what the future looks like. I don't envy them. Like that's that's a lot of work. Like they've got a they've got a a lot of um, long hours ahead of them to figure it all out. I mean, obviously they've got some high level ideas about it, mm -hmm. but executing it is going to be a lot of work. And I, I I hope they succeed. I really do. I yeah. I want to I want to have a Versa controlled in my fusion. You know, <laughs> like I I want those things. And I know you but probably why? disagree with me on that. Works. It already works. I, Listen, you I know have, you don't I care have, about having like 30 apps on your phone. I do. Like, I just want one single pane of glass, you know, one ring to, hey, you know what? All. Sometimes having 30 apps is easier to navigate than having 30 functions uh, cryptically nested within a single app. Sometimes yeah. it, it's actually quite quick. Like my AI works as fast as you can tap on it. <laughs> but like, and again, Ecotech could have done this, but just an example, um, hey, change 30 gallons of my aquarium water. But hey, if this really high float switch in my sump activates, meaning that you're adding water, but water is not getting removed because there's something wrong with one of the dosing heads, stop, right? If else, um, those kind of things. Hey, if you detect water on the basement floor where <laughs> I'm draining my uh, old salt water, stop doing the water change stuff like that right it's the integration of different 
indicators and and acting on them and that's what i've I always believe loved these about companies fusion. are going to operate mostly independently but there's just going to be a lot more friendly communication and cross-pollination of talent and ideas to make the mothership the su i'm calling it the super group i believe they're going to be forming a holding group you know between uh, Bertram Capital and these other companies so it'll be you know kind of like a super band of you know whatever companies they, they pull together um, but yeah I think uh, I've said enough about about it you know I think there's a lot of examples where this is gonna be positive and you know we just have to have faith and you can't really help it uh, definitely the the super group of Neptune BRS e Ecotech AI they got some some splaining to do to the local fish stores somehow to assure them that they're not going to eat their lunch, you know, with their fully vertically integrated company. And uh, I'm not one of those kind of stakeholders. So I, you know, a lot less is riding on it for me. But, you know, I got my products. The my tanks look amazing. My lights work. My flow pumps work. My dosing pumps work. I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, I mean, it's. It's just, I, honestly, I think all the forums, it's just something fun to talk about. The people that get really irate, I don't get. The people that want to speculate, I get, because it's kind of fun to chat about. Um, I don't have any skin in the game either. I'm, I'm just a hobbyist. I don't, I don't have a... I don't a casual, know. advanced hobbyist. <laughs> I am. I mean, <laughs> if it all goes to SHIT, uh, like, it's okay. Like, I'll figure something out oh, you know? we'll fall back on our diy roots like we you know yeah. started this hobby i don't out need on, like, a controller no yeah, you know exactly. i'll pull out some you know i'm sure somebody in china is building some I led will lights rebuild that my are good aquadine my open source ish <laughs> aquadine i'll just make it work yeah uh, it'll be good but no i think it was a really good time to have a session of reef therapy and just chat us all out i hope this kind of touches upon you know a lot of things that people have been thinking about and like i said next week i'm going to be at ecotech marine i'm going to do some sit down interviews with them for our channel for their channel um and i think a lot more details from their own mouth will really uh, go a long way to um just getting people just to cool their jets and just feel better about the situation which it took me it took me a little bit by surprise because i didn't really see them going that route but just talking to them for 20 30 minutes i understood how it really made sense i mean it's so much work no oh, from an owner's perspective and then like you said um carrying chasing the company on oh, your own for 15 yeah. years is i think that's what they're up to now that's a ton of work and if anyone who's a small business owner um or even a large business owner if you have to uh carry that yourself you know how good it feels to have help to, oh, yeah. you know, get into the next chapters of your company's uh, history. Yeah, and hopefully they listen to this and hopefully uh, your time with Ecotech calms things down just in time for the next announcement of an well, acquisition. <laughs> <laughs> well, it also depends what they say. You know, I, I could all, we could sit here and like speculate, but I just would much rather just go over, feed my fish and see how my corals are, see how my new Latoria, you know, scribbled brain corals looking. I'd, I'd rather spend my time doing that than, you know, throwing darts at a uh Well, think about board. all the companies that are really no more that we used to worship, right? I mean, PFO, like I was all about their... Um, metal halide ballasts and i i guess ice cap is still around making turf scrubbers and stuff um i don't know there's just a lot of um hell i used to use coral life salt when i started you are i <laughs> ultraviolet resources international yes. i'm starting to collect vho lamps because stores are throwing them away and they're like hey do you want this i'm like yep i got a spot for them I just I got the ballast. I just need some end caps. I need a wiring harness, and I'm going to revisit some VHO reefs sooner than I think. I'm, I'm not. I think these companies, and I hope they do well, and I think they will. I th uh, you know, the the limited number of people I've met behind the scenes all seem like really smart, passionate people. So I'm not saying they're going to fail. What I'm saying is. All the crap I used to run my reef tank on, those companies really don't exist anymore, mm -hmm. right? When but I'm when still I was in the at, hobby. Uh, 
Man, uh, Euro yeah. Reef is gone. ETS is gone. ETS is gone. When I was at the uh, Dallas World Aquarium, you know what I saw behind the scenes? A what? Precision Marine. Precision Marine. Skimmer. Remember the and HSA they're in Texas. skimmers? I mean, they had ads out. I mean, as yeah. recently as a couple years ago, I remember writing stories about things they were doing as recently as like three or four years ago. So I don't know if they're like totally gone, but that used to be one of the tops, you know, definitely one of the tops. And uh, yeah, yeah. Nothing is forever. Yeah. except change so cheers to that i don't know how a better way to put, draw the curtains on this um seminal session of reef therapy but mark thanks for hashing it out with me once again as always thanks for having me cool and thanks everybody for listening make sure to uh rate us if you listen to it on your favorite podcatcher um youtube is a great place to engage us in comments I think we'll do a little Q and A section, uh, you know, in a forthcoming. Uh, we got to get. We got to talk. Uh, we did promise books too. We got to yep. get that back up there. Yep, we'll get on it. Cool. Well, until next week. Bye, Mark. Bye to all the listeners and viewers, and we'll catch you next time. See you guys. Bye.